I'm very excited for you guys to be here. Um, you know, when, when I was in high school, I didn't really like math. And uh, that put me at a disadvantage now that I'm doing math all the time. Because I didn't have a program like this when I was growing up. So I was only exposed to the kind of math they teach you in high school, which wasn't always the best. But what you're gonna see today is a different flavor of that. You're gonna see what you can actually do and what you can't do with stuff. Which excites me still to this day. And like I said, I wish it had been around when I was in your position. Now before I go on, there's a group of people that we need to thank because this event really wouldn't be possible without, you know, people like Junichi or uh, I have a whole list of people I need to go through. So let me just thank them real quick. So there's Maurice, there's Yu Yang, there's Lucas, Maggie, Surya, Jonathan, and last but not least, this guardian angel of these guys called Anina. You'll see her in the lounge. The best lady there is. She's basically the reason why this group is still going on. But the more I talk, the less you get to hear about this guy. This is Vlad Ristov. He runs the, you might not have seen it, but when you walk by the elevator, there's a glass door. That's the wet lab at Bronx. He runs that and he, he does all these cool experiments. And I'll let him tell you exactly what they do in there because I don't actually know. I try to sneak in from time to time, but I get kicked out all the time. Like, take it away. Thanks, Earl. If you guys will let me, I will talk without shoes on. My shoes got wet on the way in. Is that okay? Makes me a little shorter, so that's okay. Um, yeah, so I'm in applied math here. I'm gonna tell you about what applied math is, at least one version of it. It might look like biology at some times, computer science at other times, math, physics, engineering, maybe it's everything. So we have this applied math lab that you'll walk by and uh, if you go in the front of the building, you'll see our nice posters and you'll see some of these images. So uh, take a look at that also. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna tell you about fluid dynamics and swimming and flying. So I'm gonna tell you about how insects fly, uh, how birds fly, which is different, and how fish swim. Um, and I'm gonna avoid too many equations or anything. Actually, you won't, probably won't see any. Instead, I'm gonna tell it through pictures and movies. So. It's early in the morning, it'll wake us up. So, um, okay, so let's get into it. I got into insect flight during my PhD, and one of the things that drew me in there is, it's a fascinating thing how insects fly, and it's so fascinating that it's drawn a lot of myths. For example, do you guys, have you heard of the bumblebees can't fly myth? That's kind of a popular one. So there was this, this is the root of it. There was a scientist in the 1930s who was trying to apply the aerodynamics that we understand for airplane wings. So an airplane wing is basically something that moves steadily through the air, constant speed. Uh, and there's a flow over the wing, produces lift, forces. And he tried to apply that known theory to something that's moving its wings very differently, a bumblebee that flaps its wings. And he says, if I calculate the forces, it's not enough to hold the insect up. Therefore, flight is impossible, and bumblebees cannot fly. Okay, so that's a myth. They really can fly. We just don't understand the fluid dynamics of it. And by the way, I'm going to say fluid dynamics. That's air, water, anything that flows, okay? Gases and liquids are both fluids, okay? So um, another well-known myth from around the same time is uh, sort of a <coughs> misestimate of how fast these guys move. So they move fast, and they move their wings very fast, uh, but they're not supersonic. Okay, they don't, they don't beat the speed of sound. So that's another myth. And I think these myths basically uh, kind of come about because insects are so fascinating. And so this uh, video is a nice video, which is another myth, this is fake, uh, that shows you uh, what insects, why they're fascinating. Okay, this is not real. This is the one fake video I'll show you today. Okay, but uh, they are very strong flyers. They can't lift a toad, but they're very strong flyers. Um, so, uh, we're fascinated by insect flight, and in the first part of the talk, what I'm going to talk about is exactly how insects fly. How do they move their wings? Uh, how do they adjust their wings to do a maneuver? So how do they do maneuvering flight? I'm going to show you on a real insect how this all works. Uh, and one of the most important issues is how to just stay upright in the air. So this is a problem called stability. Um, so it's one thing to generate enough lift to hold your body weight up. It's another issue altogether to maintain that orientation and not topple over. 
And so that's an issue of stability. Uh, and then later I'm going to tell you about uh, efforts to try to build insects. So can we make a mechanical version of an insect? And then also maybe not so much an insect, but other types of flying machines. Okay, So inventing kind of new ways to fly. And then at the very end, I'll tell you a little bit about bird flight and fish swimming and why they're very similar. Um, and uh, understanding in particular why fish and birds like to move together in groups. So why do they form schools? Why do they form flocks? And the fluid dynamics of that. So that's kind of roughly where we're going. Um, OK, first, a zoomed in view of how insects fly. So this is the experimental apparatus that I built. So I, do, I spend 90% of my time doing experiments. Um, and that means building things and hooking things up together. Um, and this is a gadget to look at how an insect flies. And uh, insects are small. So the insects I'm studying are fruit flies, which are about yay big, a couple of millimeters long. These are the little guys who are on your bananas. They're coming out right now in the springtime. Um, so the way we study this is they're very fast. So you have to have high-speed cameras. So I have three high-speed cameras that view a chamber where the insects fly around. And each camera is backlit. So I'm going to show you some images and videos where the insect shows up as a shadow because there's light coming kind of toward the camera. And uh, I built up this system. And it's nice. It has a motion trigger. So there's actually a couple of laser beams here that when the fly flies through those, it detects it and t tells the cameras to start recording. So you can kind of record at the right moment. Um, there's me operating the thing. Uh, it's actually operated with red light because insects can't see red. And you don't want to blind them. So that's nice. Um, and the images look like this. So I'll have three camera views. And you're going to see a shadow of an insect flying around. Looks like that, a silhouette. And uh, these cameras are super duper cameras. So uh, they look like this. They're about this big. And uh, the main thing is they can take uh, up to a million frames per second. So that's ridiculous. So uh, you know your usual like video camera, like what I'm being filmed with, is about 30 frames per second. This is up to a million. And I'm going to need about 10,000 to, to capture the flight motions of an insect. So you need a very high speed camera. Um, and what do you see when you do this? Well, you get something like this. So here I'm showing the three views. This is what the top camera sees when it looks down on the insect flying. And these are the two side views, two right angles like that. And again, the size scale is this guy is just a few millimeters long. This is a fruit fly. Uh, it's beating ridiculously fast, 200, 300 uh, flaps per second. So this is very slowed down, so you can see everything. Uh, and I'm filming very fast, right, So and playing it back slowly. And one thing you immediately see is uh, insects don't beat their wings up and down. Okay, they don't do this. Some people think they do that. They don't. They go back and forth. Okay, so they're sweeping their wings back and forth like that. And it's a little hard to see exactly how they're moving their wings. Um, well, I'll show you in a 3D reconstruction, first of all, how this works. So um, this is where I put on my computer scientist hat. And I have to take those videos and write a code to automatically figure out the 3D posture of the insect and its wings as it moves through time. And so that's what's being done here, is I have these three views. And I wrote a big uh, code, which basically kind of uh, replays this motion on a model insect here. So you can actually see the 3D motion of it. And you have tons of data that then you can do other things with, like figure out the, the flows around the wings and things like that. Um, so that's a reconstruction of the flight, uh, you know, right wing and a left wing and a body. And uh, do you guys see a, the basic way in which it's moving its wings? I'll, I'll reenact it live and big. The basic way is like this. Here's my, my big wing. And I sweep this way, and I flip over and sweep this way. OK? Like that, over and over again. And so it's kind of like a helicopter. A helicopter basically has wings that it slightly tilts up and then steadily sweeps all the way around and keeps spinning. These guys uh, can't keep spinning their wings, so they have to stop, flip over, and go back like this. And that way, they can produce the lift they need to hold up their body weight and fly. And um, OK, so that's the basics of this is basically hovering flight. It's almost staying still in place. And um, fortunately, in the 10 years leading up to us getting all this data, people began to figure out the fluid dynamics of how these wings work. And this was supposed to play. And so the way they did that is they didn't work in air because air is very hard to study in many ways. So they actually put a giant wing, oops, 
in, uh, in, in oil and have a little robot that flaps this wing around. They can then study all the fluid dynamics of it. Okay, so hopefully you see there's some bubbles being released here so you can see all the flows around. And one of the key things here is that the fluid dynamics in different liquids or gases is all the same. It's all governed by the same equation. So you can study flying in air by instead flapping a different sized wing at a different speed in oil. So that's one of the key things you can do. And uh, the main lesson they learned is that uh, what is the missing force from aerodynamic force that these insects need? So if you do a usual airplane calculation, you don't get enough force for them to fly. There's something missing. And what's missing is this vortex that sits on the wing. So hopefully you see that. There's like a tornado that's spinning along the wing here. And the way you should think of a vortex in a fluid is something where there's low pressure. A low pressure zone causes a little swirl. And so there's a low pressure that sits on top of the wing, and that's generating the force that holds the guy up. And so people began to, right before we got our data, figure out uh, the basics of the forces. But the question is, how does an insect manipulate these forces to do all the things that it does in the air? So um, that's about maneuvering flight. So that was our first series of studies. How do insects do maneuvers? And you can do all sorts of maneuvers. There are lots of cool ones. Uh, it ends up that insects really do one nice type of maneuver, which is a sharp turn. And the reason why they do that is when they're uh, flying around, they're trying to find your like rotten banana, right? So they need to search. So the way they search is they fly in a straight line, sniff around there, then take a rapid turn, fly another straight line, sample over here, and whichever smells sweeter, they go in that direction. So they do a series of these straight flights and rapid turns. Um, the problem is, if you set up cameras somewhere, they won't do that rapid turn where you want them to do it. So you have to somehow trick them to turn where your cameras are aimed. That's kind of hard. OK, so how do you do that? You use a, a, a sort of an optical illusion to make them do it. So what I do is I take my apparatus here. So this is the same one I showed you before, high-speed cameras. But I'm fitting it with a little arena, which is a LED display of lights. So basically, it's a circular sort of arena where the fly will look in there, and it can see light patterns. And I can move the lights around. Why would you do that? Well, if you put a striped pattern on there and then move it, it makes the fly dizzy and actually has a response where it actually wants to move with the light pattern. So if it sees its whole world as this light pattern and the light pattern starts to move, it'll actually turn with it. It's kind of a weird response. We actually have the exact same thing. Uh, if you put a person in a hallway with striped patterns that are moving, we will walk with the patterns so that they look fixed to us. We don't like things moving in our, in our background. So flies don't either. And so they'll turn with this pattern. So here, um, here's the movie that you get from this. So there's the pattern not shown. That's going to be up here in a big, big ring. The fly is initially hovering. And then she sees the moving pattern. So this is a she in this case. I don't know if you can tell. That's hard to tell. I can tell. So, uh, and then it does a rapid turn toward the right. And I say rapid, but you're seeing it in slow motion, so you don't think it's rapid. Um, and so it does this turn and then flies off. So it's a nice little compact maneuver where it's basically hovering, and then it does this turn, and it must be doing something different with its wings to do that turn, and we can figure it all out, how it works. Um, and I did say it's rapid. This guy basically does, not a 180, but it basically turns around uh, in a total of 15 wing beats, but remember its wing beats are very fast, so convert that to real time, and it's 60 milliseconds, 0.06 seconds. So is that fast? Kind of sounds like it might be fast. Uh, what is a blink of an eye? Anybody know uh, how long it takes you to blink your eye? It's about 300 milliseconds, so about a third of a second. So if you blink, this guy can do several turns. He can do five turns, maybe, when you blink. So uh, these turns are very, very fast. If you blink, you miss it. You need a high-speed camera to see it all. And not only is the turn fast, I mean, the wing motions are even faster. right? So you got to get all that data. So but we can get it all and uh, digest how they actually do these turns. And um, the way we do that is we measure a bunch of angles that describe how the wings move. And you get a bunch of. Uh, angles over time that we record. So our data looks like that. And that tells you how the wings are wiggling in all their different directions. 
And um, it's kind of hard once you get all this data to figure out how it all works. I mean, you, you get this, you have these time and these angles and they're wiggling and uh, here's before the turn, here's this middle part, they do the turn, they stop doing the turn, uh, but this angle changes and so does that one some and so does that one some and how does it all work? So um, to digest it all, what we did is we built an insect flight simulator. So that's using the known fluid forces on these wings and we can build this kind of computer version of a fly and then we can replay the motions that we measure, the wing motions that we measure on this guy and see how it turns. And uh, so for example here, it's, I haven't turned on the wing motions yet, but then when I turn on the wing motions that make it turn, it does indeed turn. And do you guys see how, what it did differently to do the turn? I couldn't either. So it ends up adjusting angles about five degrees here and there adjusting the way its wing is oriented, just tiny, tiny amounts. Um, I might be able to reenact it though, so I'm gonna try to on this chair. This is a live experiment, I haven't checked it out in advance, so it might just fail. But I did bring two wings, I did, do have a chair for me to sit on here, and it's, uh, okay, let's see if this works. I'm gonna give myself plenty of room because I have long arms. Okay, so here's me hovering, right? I don't wanna knock over my robots over there. Here's me hovering. Now I'm gonna try and do the turn. <laughs> I started to do it. Did you guys see me turning? Yeah, let me try it again. Slowly, not as impressive as I wanted. What I'm doing is when I bring my wings forward, I'm moving them like this. That's gonna generate a big force on this one and then turn me a little bit. When I go backwards, I'm going to do it like that, generate a big force on this one. It's going to turn me over a little more. And so I keep doing that where I go, and that allows me to turn, okay? This guy's doing the same thing, but he's adjusting those angles like plus minus five degrees. So you don't notice it on here. And that's the main point. Uh, these guys have to beat so hard to hold their body weight up that to do anything else is easy in a way. They just change the angles a little bit, change the forces allows them to do the things they need to do. So it's kind of amazing that they're not herky-jerky flying all over the place because any little change will lead to a difference in the forces. Um, okay, so that kind of leads into the next issue with insect flight is how do these guys keep stable? So what does that mean? That means, you know, if, for example, when I'm flying along and I hiccup and I accidentally move my wing a little bit differently on this side and that side, I should be turning all over the place but they don't, they're able to fly very straight if they want to. So how do they deal with that? How do they um, kind of keep on course? How do they keep upright in flight? And so that's stability, that's the issue of stability. Um, how do we study that? Well, I had this idea that I wanted to poke the flies in the air while they're flying, kind of trip them up a little bit and see how they deal with that. And my advisor, this is for my PhD, said I was crazy, that I, I can't poke them while they're flying. They're tiny, fast little things. So here's my idea for how to do it. I figured out how to glue a little magnet backpack onto the flies, the tiny little guy. So this little magnet, here I'm holding it actually with a sewing needle. So I'm holding it so I can take a picture and show you. But you see a little drop of glue? It's tiny. Okay, so you put a little magnet uh, backpack on the fly and now it can carry that backpack and go and fly around. In fact, the ones that escaped into our lab uh, people who uh, would kill my flies by, we get stabbed by these, and so they stopped killing my flies. <laughs> so, um, and then what I did is I take this little guy, and I let it free in our chamber, and I have some magnetic coils in there. So basically I use the laser trigger signal that the, when these guys fly in a certain zone, I capture the fact that they're there, and I not only use that signal to film, I also use it to turn on a current in these, in these coils, and it'll make a magnetic field, and then when you have a magnet and a magnetic field, it twists the guy around. So it's basically applying a little torque to the guy in the air, a little force. So that's the idea, and I um, called this guy the trip apparatus. Torque, rapid, impulse, perturbation. Okay, so I wanna trip the insect in the air. So this is the first movie I got from this. This is a top view of an insect flying along. There's a little backpack. Here I hit it with the magnetic field and knock it off course, and then you can see it recover. So it's flying, and I knock it off course, and then it comes back. In fact, if you look at a before and after, 
So here is it before I hit it with the field, and then after it comes back to the almost the exact same angle. So it's very impressive. They, they are going some direction, and if you knock them off course, they just go right back to that same direction. They're very good. Um, and so here's a 3D movie of the same thing. So here again is a 3D reconstruction. You see a little backpack I even put on the reconstruction there. So there's the magnet. Oops. And um, it's flying along. And I'm going to put actually a little red arrow above it when I turn the magnetic field on. So it's flying along. Here it's descending a little bit. I turn on the field. I put it on just for one wing beat and then turn it off. And then let it fly from there. So now you should see it's now turned to face us because I hit it with the field. But then over maybe five or ten wing beats, it actually makes a corrective turn to come back on course again. And so the way that looks is like this. I, I find the top view easy to, to look at. Here it's flying along. I hit it. It's now faced us. But then it corrects over five or ten wing beats. And so this was the first discovery of the autopilot that an insect has. So insects have an autopilot, a built-in rapid response that allows them to keep on course when they're flying. Okay. Um, again, what does our data look like? Well, we can measure where the body is oriented and we like it's flying along at some angle. We hit it and it comes back. It's very accurate in how it comes back. So you can see it's more accurate than our motion tracking program. So it's you know, accurate to within a couple of degrees. Um, so uh, it's very good that way. This is actually a measure of what the wings are doing. So the wings are, are again doing this sort of what I call a paddling motion where they're changing some angles uh, for a couple of wing beats. And that's what's shown over here. So I hit it with the impulse. There's a little delay. And then it turns on a response. and comes back to the, to the same angle. And uh, it changes its wings very little. Again, 5 or 10 degrees. So just little tiny wiggles. That's all it needs. OK, so that's the autopilot of, of insects that keep them on course. And uh, how does it actually work? So here you have to put on your biology hat or your anatomy hat. Uh, they have a special organ completely devoted to sensing their body orientation when they're flying. It's a very cool little thing. It's called a, there's a pair of them called haltiers. And it looks like a little knob that sits under the wing. And it flaps just like the wings do. And it's a kind of gyroscope. So I don't know if you've ever seen gyros a gyroscope, a spinning gyroscope. This is a flapping gyroscope that essentially when the body twists, it, it alters the motion of the uh, little haltiers. And it can sense how fast it's been twisted. So that allows it to sense when you've hit it with the magnetic field. And then it can respond accordingly. So that's the idea. It's got this little autopilot where this is the sensor. It has a little neural circuit that tells it, OK, look, I've been hit. Uh, wings, uh, wing muscles adjust the way you're twitching so that we can adjust the aerodynamic forces and make a correction. And so there's a little feedback loop here that allows it to, uh, to keep on course. And this feedback loop is always running because this guy is flying, and there's a little uh, gust of wind, right? And uh, it gets knocked off course. It needs to correct for it. So it's always running. And um, it's not just in the course correction that it's doing this. It's also staying upright that it does this. So if it's flying along here and you knock it down, you pitch it down, nose down, it'll correct and come back up. So it uses this actually for all three angles of the body. So there's the yaw, which tells you where it's headed. There's the pitch, which is its elevation. And there's also a roll, which I'm not showing you about. But it actually uses it for all three directions because it needs to maintain that body orientation during flight. So, um, and why does it need it? Well, it's not just for navigation. It's actually to keep upright at all. So if you take our flight simulator and you just put in insect flight motions and let it free, but with no haltiers, no feedback loop, uh, the guy tumbles down. And that, the reason is it's unstable. There is something intrinsically unstable. It's like, uh, it's like trying to hold a stick upright, right? It'll just fall down. There's an instability there. And these guys also have an instability that uh, causes their body orientation to rock around and tumble from the air. So they need a feedback loop to adjust their wings, even just to stay upright at all. Not just to get from A to B, but to stay upright. So um, that's what the flight simulator tells us. And we can actually test this experimentally. We can turn off the autopilot for an insect. OK, this is a cruel experiment. But what you can do is you can take that little halt here. And I told you it flaps. It needs to flap to be able to sense. But if you glue it down, there's a little bit of glue there. It can't flap anymore. So basically, I'm turning off its ability to sense. What do you think is going to happen 
it's going to fall. So yeah, if we take a high-speed camera view of the side, it's going to fall down. And it, by eye, it just looks like it's falling. But if you actually look at the high-speed video, it's actually flapping its wings. In fact, it's flapping its wings basically the same way it normally would. But it doesn't have any feedback, so it doesn't know how to keep its body upright. So it just tumbles down. So that's kind of sad. So I felt bad for these guys. So I said, is there some way I can restore their stability? And so this is the idea I came up with. I can modify the insect a little bit. So um, here's my insect. And uh, I've glued a little hairdo onto it. And what this is, actually, it's a, it's a little bit of a dandelion seed. Okay. And I was thinking, well, if I do that, maybe it will sort of kill off this instability that's making its body rock all around. Now it can make the flight nice and smooth. And in fact, if you let this guy fly, this one has no halteers. Halteers are glued down. But you put these, uh, these dandelion seeds, and you can stabilize the flight again. It doesn't rock around. So what's the lesson here? There's actually two ways you can fly. One is with what's called passive stability. That means just from the aerodynamics and the, the forces there, it's stable, staying upright. And then there's active control, where you have an instability that would want to toss you around. But instead, you use sensors and adjust your wing motions to keep yourself upright. OK. Um, it ends up that we're unstable, right? If you look at me, um, supported down there on my feet. And if I didn't do anything at all, I would just fall down, right? I'm in an unstable position. I'm supported down below, and I'm heavy up here. I'm going to fall down. So we're unstable, but we're using active control all the time. And so your legs are applying tiny little forces to adjust my orientation and keep me upright. So we're kind of like the flies. But we have it much easier because our instability is very slow. So our muscles have no problem adjusting to it. These guys are violently unstable. They want to flip very quickly. And so they need to have fast wings to adjust to all that. OK. So um, I looked up a bunch of insects after I figured out this for the fruit fly and found they're almost all unstable. So that means pretty much all insects uh, rely on some sensors. It may not be the same sensors as the fruit fly, but they need something to keep them upright at all. And so I compiled a bunch of data and did a bunch of calculations and simulations and figured out, yeah, they're all unstable. So um, the basic problem is none of them have these dandelion seed sort of uh, attachments on them, except for one. I found one guy that has it. So this is called a woolly aphid, also a fuzzle butt. Uh, and this is the one guy that has what looks like passive stability. So it has these little fibers built into it. And uh, in upstate New York, where I was at the time when I was doing this, you can, uh, you can actually find these flying around. They're very slow. So, uh, but presumably, they don't need any sensors to keep upright. What do you think the disadvantage of this is? The disadvantage is they're not maneuverable. So they get eaten by things that are faster and more maneuverable than them. So uh, this is a wasp. Uh, actually, it's a type of fly. Do you see its halter here? It's kind of showing off that it has active control by having a neon green halter. And this guy's very fast and maneuverable, and it can easily catch the slow, passively stable one. And so there's that, always this trade-off when you're flying. Um, you can be kind of uh, stable. You don't need active control to stabilize yourself. But then you're usually not very maneuverable. Um, that's what a passenger airplane is. It ends up being pretty much stable, but it can't turn very quickly or anything. But a fighter jet is actually unstable, and it wants to rip around and roll. It has lots of instabilities in it, but it uses computer control and autopilot to stabilize itself all the time. But then when it needs to do a rapid turn because someone's coming at it, it turns that off and it can spin and uh, do some evasive maneuver. So that's the trade-off in flying. And insects have the, the same type of thing, passive versus active uh, stability. So as I was wrapping up my work on insect flight, I got hungry to actually try and build one of these things. And so I talked to a couple of groups who were building them um, and uh, are building robot versions of insects. So I want to show you what they look like. Uh, this is a friend of mine who was at Cornell. And he's built this gadget that flaps its wings with a little motor. And so it flies like this. But um, he has to cheat a little bit. You don't really see it here, but there's a wire that's holding the insect. So it can move along a wire. And the reason is it's an unstable way to fly, right? We learned that from insects. That if you beat your wings back and forth, normally you would flip over. So he has to cheat and put it on a little guide to keep it from flipping over. 
Okay, you can't let it free. Um, what happens if you let one of these free? Well, there's another group at Harvard uh, building uh, these kind of robots, and this is what happens. So generating the force, the lift, to hold yourself up is not the problem at all. It's just keeping upright <laughs> once you're there. That's the hard part. And this guy has the same instability that we found for fruit flies. And so that's the reason why we don't have a bunch of flapping wing robots right now flying around. They might be nice and maneuverable, but uh, they're, not, they're not stable. Um, so uh, what did they resort to? Well, they basically took the fuzzle butt approach. So they couldn't stabilize these things any other way, so they added these uh, dandelion type uh, uh, stabilizers. So in this case, they look like sails or tails that they add on to there. So maybe, you know, it's, it's a nice solution. It's maybe not the most elegant thing, but at least it kind of works. These can now be set free. But now they're much bigger and more awkward flyers. Okay, so um, that's what other people are doing in terms of building robots. And I started getting into this, and I wanted to think of maybe there's just entirely different ways to fly, a new way to fly. So um, I got inspired by the Wright brothers, uh, and what they did is they were trying to figure out how to fly. Uh, by the way, they didn't figure out, they weren't the first to figure out like how to generate lift. They were the first to control flight. So actually that's what their patent is for. It's for adjusting the wings so they can adjust the forces so they can keep upright. so They don't tumble over. So it's not about lift for them. It's again about stability. And the way they figured that out is by building a wind tunnel. So that's their wind tunnel here. Uh, the idea is that in, when you're flying, you have a wing that's moving through air. But you can study that same situation by moving air past a wing. So they built this box that has a fan on it and blows air past a wing, and they can figure out all the aerodynamics needed to stabilize. So uh, I wanted to build a wind tunnel for flapping flight. So instead of having a constant wind blow across a wing, have a, wi a wind that goes up and down, that oscillates somehow. So uh, that's what this device is. This is a device you would find in our lab right here. Um, and what it is, is it's actually just a speaker, a loudspeaker. So a loudspeaker vibrates. Um, and it moves air up and down in a column here. So basically it just oscillates the air. So it's a flapping wind tunnel. And you can put bugs in there, which will look like things like this, little paper pyramids, okay? And you can set them free in there. And this is why we, we call a paper bug and see whether it can fly. Okay, now the air is just moving up and down, but you have this type of shape. Why do you think this would be able to fly? How can it generate lift? I mean, the air is not constantly pushing on it, right? The air is moving up and down. So what's the key? It's the shape, yeah. It's the fact that when the air moves up, it sees sort of a different shape for when the air moves down. So, um, this is a nice way to study flapping flight. And so you can actually make this, and amazingly, it's stable. So you can set this free in the air. There's air going up and down. And you set this little bug free, and it's able to fly. And so this looks a lot like, as you said, uh, da Vinci's parachute. And it's got intrinsic stability to it. So it doesn't want to fall over. Um, that's a nice property of it. In fact, you can make uh, umbrellas. So there's an umbrella, OK? And it can fly around in there. What other things can you levitate? This is my personal favorite. I like this one. I don't know if you can see the shape of this thing, but it looks like a UFO. Maybe you can see it here. What it is is it's a torus that, uh, so it's shaped kind of like a donut. Um, and at each part, if you take a cut of it, you would see a kind of a wedge shape like this, a triangle shape. And then it's wrapped around like that. And you put this in the up and down flow, and it's beautifully stable flying. So there's something about this sort of shape and this flow up and down that can stabilize flight. And notice it's stable without any sails, tails, fuzzle butts, uh, dandelion seeds, right? It's just stable by itself. So that's kind of interesting. So that inspired me to think of a new type of flyer that we could build. And uh, the idea was, OK, so in that setup, I was moving the air up and down. And the, the flyer was just kind of sitting there, feeling the air. Now what I'm going to do is make a flyer that moves up and down itself. So it's powered. It's a robot. And flies in still air. Okay, So it's kind of an idea like this, where you have something that looks like, uh, I don't know, an umbrella opening and closing. So it closes, maybe would squirt air down, 
power itself up and then open again and score it like that. So that was the idea, and I actually built this guy. Here's some, some components of it. Uh, I'll show you, I brought a few versions of it. This is a, a big version, okay? So and it's missing the motor. But it's basically four wings like this, and there's a crank here that when you turn it around, it brings the wings in and out, okay? And this was an early version of the robot that failed miserably, okay? It was way, ends up being way too heavy. It didn't look too heavy, but it is too heavy. It weighs almost nothing, but still not enough. To fly, you have to be very light. So uh, here, where's the version that actually worked? Oh, here it is. Here's a version that worked. Uh, much lighter, uh, tiny, tiny wings that are very thin, right? It's got a motor on there now, you see it? That's the motor there. And it cranks these wings around, they open and close, they squirt air downward, and that allows it to fly. Okay, so that's the type of robots we built. I brought uh, 10 of them here to show you that when you're wearing your engineering hat, sometimes you have to try, try again. Right? It, takes a, it takes a few iterations to make this thing work. What happened? <laughs> um, okay, so, but it actually does work. And, um, okay, this is the way it looks. I call it an arrow jelly. And the reason is once I actually built the thing and looked at it, I realized I had reinvented the jellyfish. So a jellyfish uh, is basically like a, uh, a sack like this that contracts and squirts air down to move through water. This is an air version of it. It brings its wings all together to throw air down so it can generate the lift it needs to go up. And uh, so this is a flying jellyfish, and it does fly once you set it free. Um, so here's some test flight videos. This is basically when it's hovering. So what I do is I um, power the motor just enough to hold its body weight up, and it flies around. Again, this is slowed down. So this guy beats its wings about um, 20 times per second, 20 to 25 times per second. So it's, it just looks like a blur if you're watching it. Um, and you set it free, and a beautiful property of it is that it's upright stable. So it won't ever fall over, right? It'll run around and, and, and uh, do a herky-jerky flight, but it doesn't tip over. So it's got this upright stability. Um, and you can make it do other things like ascend. So that's what's shown here. Uh, if you put a little more power on the motor, you can make it go up, okay? And so it's got built-in stability during all these maneuvers, which is nice. Uh, I didn't have to add any, like, tails or other things to make it stable. It's just built into the way the aerodynamics of how it works. So um, you can, yeah, and you can make it do different maneuvers. So this is, uh, again, we can do our motion tracking of this and figure out how it goes up, uh, how to make it hover around in place or go forward by adjusting its wing motions in different ways. So it's the first uh, flapping wing flying machine that has built-in stability uh, with no disadvantage, no disadvantage of having extra sails and tails that would slow it down. This guy can still do maneuvers just fine uh, because it has a, a different type of stability to it. Okay, so uh, in the final, I think I may have already run over, so I'll just give a couple of uh, little bits about birds and fish. So that was all on insects and insect-like flying machines. Uh, birds and fish are different in that, you know, a bird basically does move its wing up and down. So it moves its wing up and down as it's flying along. Uh, fish are kind of the same thing. They move a tail back and forth as they move through water. So if you look at a fish from above, it's the same thing as looking at a bird from the side. And so in our lab, we can study the fluid dynamics of this by using mechanical bird wings or fish tails, however you like to think of it. So that's what's shown here. Um, this is actually in a water tunnel, so you can study swimming or flying both in water, that's fine. This is a 3D printed wing, so you can 3D print a wing, and then you can release dyes so you can actually learn about the fluid dynamics of it. Um, and uh, hopefully you saw there that uh, once you're flapping, it's uh, beautifully complicated, right? So uh, this is what steady flow past a wing looks like. So maybe an airplane wing would see something like this, right? And then now I turn on the flapping also, and you can see all these vortices get shed from the wings. And so again, just like insect flight was about that vortex that sits on the wing, uh, bird flight and fish swimming is also about uh, how a flapping wing generates vortices and lets them into the fluid. Um, and in fact, when you look at uh, what's called the wake, the flow behind either a bird or a fish, you see this very interesting pattern of vortices where you get a swirl here, followed by a swirl here, followed by a swirl here. 
So this has a, a name, uh, it's a, basically a train of vortices that gets left behind in the flapping motion. And so that allows us to study how birds fly and fish swim, the fluid dynamics of it. And one of the most interesting things is looking at schools and flocks. So I'll show you a couple of things about that. So here's what one of our experiments look like where we're thinking about two fish swimming together or two birds in a flock. And so it's a mechanical version of that where you have just the wings of the bird. And they're flapping up and down, but they're, um, they get to sort of talk to each other through the flow because they're swimming and leaving flows and the next guy can come and play in it. So these kind of experiments allow us to understand schools and flocks. And it's very interesting if you zoom in and put particles in the flow and take high-speed video and figure out how these guys work with each other, you'll have, say, a leader and a follower like this. And um, what happens is the leader, again, lays out this track of vortices. So you'll see it coming through here. Plops down these vortices behind it, just like you saw earlier. Um, and now the leader comes and plays in that. Okay, and so that's what schooling and flocking is, is all about, is, uh, is about uh, a leader leaving some flow and then the follower going and swimming or flying through that flow, possibly taking some advantage from it. Maybe, uh, maybe it saves energy, things like that. So now we're beginning to study that. And um, you can also see that here. So this is actually a simulation, a computer simulation of the, of the same. So now we have to wear our computer programmer, a computer scientist hat, and study uh, uh, this in, in a computer. And basically this solves the fluid equations that we know for a follower wing behind a leader that's here. You don't see the leader here. And the leader is putting out these red and blue vortices, and the follower is going and surfing through them. So schooling and flocking, you should think of that as basically um, sort of surfing on vortices. That's what's happening. So um, I think I'm out of time, so I'll end there. Um, but I will uh, end with this funny video that I like. It was taken about 100 years ago before the Wright brothers figured out how to fly where people were experimenting on different ways to fly. And, uh, right, like helicopters that, ooh, something bad happened. Um, other flying machines that look crazy. I think it's time to kind of revisit some uh, new ways to fly. So if you have a scheme for flying that you can dream up, uh, you know, it's worth trying to make it. You can actually build your own flyer in some version, whether it's an actual robot, whether it's a pyramid hovering in a flow, or, or something else and you can try these yourself. So um, uh, with that, I thank you for, for listening and I'll take any questions. Uh, so like, like kind of efficiency of flying or moving? Yeah, that's a big issue, and uh, it's a hard one. Um, there is some evidence. So you can compare, for example, like flying with a fixed wing, like an airplane versus a flapping wing. And there's some evidence that if you go to very small scales, like go shrink down to millimeter sizes, that it's more efficient to flap your wing than to, say, revolve it around like a helicopter. So, but that, that's a big issue and it's a very difficult one. So this kind of data might be able to go after that, um, but it's still, it's, a, it's an open question about, uh, yeah, the efficiency, of different, different ways of moving through water and air. Yeah. Why, why do you think um, mushrooms are evolved a aerodynamic way to fly? Uh, that's a good question. I do not know. So there's tons of things in water that squeeze water out to move around. So like squid, it's called jet propulsion. Uh, squids and jellyfish and things like that. I don't know of any single one in air. Yeah, this is the first one. And I don't know why, why not. Um, it could be one of those things that like, um, you know, these other types of motions evolved first and then they won, they spread everywhere. And so nature didn't quite explore all the possibilities the way we can in the lab. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I don't know the answer. But there's nothing that flies like that, like the, like the jellyfish. Nothing that I know of. All right, let's take one last question. Any other questions? All right, so. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you.